The Bible is a living story. It is a tale of good and evil, love and hate, slavery and freedom, and above all, the worship of one God. Join me now on a 10,000 mile adventure through the greatest story ever told. The Sinai Desert. The eternal wilderness where the Israelites find themselves after they've escaped Egypt. How will Moses lead them? How will he get them to the promised land? I came here to follow the Israelites' 40 year sojourn through the desert. On my journey, I had the help of an Egyptian guide as well as a Bedouin desert expert to lead me through the rugged terrain. Up to now, the Israelites have been mostly in congested areas, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Canaan. Now suddenly they burst into the open. It's almost like they shuck the skin of these other cultures and begin to develop a culture of their own. Though they believed in only one God, the Israelites had largely adapted to the Egyptian culture. Here, in the wilderness, they received the laws that will become the foundation of Judaism. They came to the wilderness of Sinai, and the Lord called to Moses from the mountain, saying, Tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. If you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. The vast emptiness is virtually unchanged since the time of the Bible. The Israelites would have to learn how to survive in the sands of the Sinai. Napoleon got bogged down here, as did the English army. Inevitably, so did we. Clever Bedouin technique would soon help set us free. That night, as we set up camp, I was amazed how little I knew about the desert. I was surprised to learn that the sun is not the greatest threat here. The biggest problem in the desert is not heat, it's cold. You can get out of the heat during the day, but you can't get out of the cold. That's why he was saying that everything is dark, the Bedouin tent, the clothes, even the bugs, they're designed to conserve heat and, and keep you warm at night. I expected the hardships of the desert but I was surprised at how isolated I felt. This extreme terrain seems to affect the Israelites too, who complain bitterly. Moses tells them, God sent you into the wilderness to learn what is in your hearts. We hear so much in the West about independence as if that's the greatest value. There is no independence in the desert. There's only dependence. Out here, you can't survive alone. The Bible seems to understand that. It's when the Israelites come into the wilderness that they inch closer to the divine. Because what happens is you turn first to the group or the family around you. And when you reach the end of that, you turn to someone or maybe something higher. The Sinai is divided into three regions. Dunes in the north, sandy hills in the center, mountains in the south. This varied geography has provided endless debate among scholars on the question of which route the Israelites took through the desert. Where is there the most water? If you were gonna settle in the Sinai for six months or a year, where would you go? 
The closest place to water is at Siravet El Kadim. There is water here and it is the best place. There are three possible routes the Israelites could have taken through the desert. The northern route seems to make the most sense because it's direct, but this would have been heavily fortified and the Israelites could easily have been caught. The central route would also seem to make sense, but there's no water there, so you can't stay there very long. The third option is to come south, and that makes sense because there are the mountains down here, and God would have led them there because he wanted to give them the Ten Commandments. So you have these three possible routes, and each of them has advantages, but also disadvantages. But what's interesting is that for 1,500 years, people have come to the south thinking this is the way that the Israelites came, so that's the way we're traveling now. In Exodus 15, soon after crossing into the Sinai, the Israelites experienced their first test of faith. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. They could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. The Bible says that after they drink, the Israelites camp by a spot that has 12 springs and 70 palms. Legend says that this is that place. It's called the Spring of Moses. <laughs> How many wells are in this area? Oh, there are many wells here. Why is this area called the Spring of Moses? They have called it the Spring of Moses since the time the sons of Israel lived here in this area and drank from this water. This would not be the last time Moses has to implore the Israelites to trust in God. Time after time, they rebel against God, who eventually labels them a stiff-necked people. The children of Israel complained, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. In the first days, the hungry Israelites make their way from oasis to oasis, such as this one called the Oasis of the Tamarisk Trees. In the springtime, a plant lice crawls into the trunk of the tamarisk, eats the bark, and excretes a white, sweet, sticky substance that forms into globules and falls to the ground. The Bedouin call this substance manna. Do you think there's some in there now? Look at this branch. It grows on the branch. Is that one? It falls from up there to the ground. Oh, oh. wow, look at that. It looks like the size of a hazelnut. The grain resembles a grain of wheat. We heat it with fire like this. And then we heat the manna. When we heat the manna, it melts, then we pour it into a bottle. The Bible says that manna is so special that it comes from heaven. When you taste it, do you feel like it's a gift from God? It has been sent from heaven. This is what it's like when it just comes off the tree. Do you have some that you've boiled down that I can taste? I have it in my house, over there. There we go. May I taste it? Taste it. Sweet. Hundred percent. It's like honey.
I was struck by how the desert landscape influences the Bible. The food that God provides is rooted in these desert sands. For the Israelites, fearful, stubborn, resolute, the desert would become their crucible of faith. The farther I got into the Sinai, the more I realized the paradox of the desert. It's a struggle to survive in this barren landscape. But as the non-essentials of life are stripped away, it allows one to focus inward and ultimately outward toward God. Since biblical times, the desert has been a place to find spiritual fulfillment. 1,500 years ago, hundreds of miles from anywhere, in the middle of nowhere, a monastery was built that is still in use today. This is St. Catherine's Monastery, built by Greek Orthodox monks. They believed the mountain behind it was where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Within its walls is the oldest operating church in the world. Services are held five times a day in Byzantine Greek. I hoped they would accept a visiting pilgrim for the night. Nice to meet you. The speak Greek now. May I speak English? Yes, sure. I speak English. What do you need? Is it possible to spend the night here? Yes, of course. Where do you come from? I come from the United States. What's your name? Bruce. And what's yeah, your name? Yeah. John. John. Nice to meet you, Father John. Now, what time are services in the morning? Four o'clock. Four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock? Every day? Every day. The accommodations here were simple but the view was epic. Some believe this plain is where the Israelites camped while Moses went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Walking through the monastery feels like stepping back in time. The place is virtually unchanged since the Middle Ages. St. Catherine's, named after a martyred Egyptian saint, contains a church, a mosque, and numerous biblical touchstones, including the well where Moses is said to have met his future wife, Zipporah. For the two dozen monks who live here today, life contains many links to the past, but they also reach out to those in the present. As part of their mission, they provide weekly supplies to local Bedouin. Exploring this medieval monastery reveals treasures at every turn. Perhaps St. Catherine's is most well known for what must be the most famous shrub in history, the biblical burning bush, in which Moses first hears the voice of God. Not long after the Bible appeared, a tradition arose that this was the bush. Behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. God called to him and said, Moses, Moses, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now what's astonishing is they actually moved the original burning bush from there to here when they built the basilica 1,500 years ago. Now what I love to think about is, can you imagine being in the meeting where they took the vote as to whether to move the burning bush or not? The bush is a species of wild raspberry that's hardly ever found in the arid Middle East. The monks claim this is the actual burning bush, but whether or not it's 3,000 years old, even they don't want it to burn. The jewel of St. Catherine's is the library. 
which houses a collection of priceless religious art and manuscripts. There are over 4,500 manuscripts, 7,000 early printed books, and 6,000 modern ones. The treasures include some of the world's oldest Bibles and the first printed editions of Homer and Plato. The monastery's first American monk, Texas native Father Justin, told me that its large collection of illuminated manuscripts is second only to the Vatican's. I was particularly moved by this ancient manuscript of the five books of Moses in Greek. Uh, we have two from the 10th century, and this is the more beautiful of the two. And let me turn to the beginning of the book of Exodus. Now the paper is so brittle. This is parchment. Where does Exodus begin and where does Genesis end? This is the conclusion of the book of Genesis, and you see how it tapers down to the last word, Genesis, with this beautiful border and the ornaments. And then Exodus begins here, here Exodus. with the border and the beautiful decorative initial. How different is this Greek from the Greek that is spoken in Greece today? This is much more classical Greek, but it is classical Greek influenced by the Hebrew and influenced very much the text that we read in the New Testament. Why is the collection here so spectacular? The climate and the extreme isolation of the monastery, the fact that it was never destroyed, never abandoned in 17 centuries, accounts for the remarkable library that we have today. Another of the library's treasures is a 1,400-year-old letter offering protection for the monastery, said to be signed by the Prophet Muhammad with his handprint. The monastery's most famous manuscript was the Codex Sinaiticus, the oldest complete Bible in existence, written in Greek almost 2,500 years ago. In 1859, it was borrowed and never returned. It's now in the British Museum. Only a few pages remain here. We have here one of the oldest, if not the oldest, Hebrew text on a pretty For the last computer. few years, computer? Father Justin has been working to bring the ancient monastery into the 21st century, digitally photographing manuscripts and posting them on the internet. I asked Father Justin if this, this Bible had clues about a long unanswered question. How many Israelites participate in the Exodus? The Hebrew Bible says 600,000 men, or 2 million overall. But some say the word for thousand has been mistranslated. The word for thousand here in Exodus 38 is Eleph. There is some idea that that also may mean clan. What, what is the Greek text? Does it give us any guidance on how many Israelites could have been here? The Greek clearly says thousands. But this is a huge, barren area. What's the population of the Sinai today? Less than 100,000. How is it possible to imagine that this many millions of people could have lived here? There's a point at which all physical explanations simply fail, and the only recourse is to say, no, they were sustained by God. Most scholars believe that many of the numbers in the Bible are idealized, including the millions of Israelites in the Exodus. But what is undeniably true is that for 15 centuries, pilgrims and monks have come here, believing they are walking in the Israelites' footsteps, making a personal connection to the story. As I walked around the medieval nooks and crannies of the monastery, I could feel the power of faith in these stones. Despite the lack of archaeological evidence linking this place to the Exodus, I kept asking myself, does it matter to my relationship with the Bible? Morning services begin at 4 a.m., so I tried to get to sleep early. It 
it's 4 a.m. Here in the Basilica, the hour is marked by the morning service. I felt privileged to witness a ritual that has been going on day after day, unchanged for the last 1,500 years. I've been doing the math. Five services a day, 1,500 years. That's three million services have been held in this church since it first opened. The total darkness, the total isolation, the total devotion, this is the most extraordinary display of faith I've ever seen. Much of the basilica is in its original condition. Even a rare Byzantine mosaic that depicts the transfiguration of Jesus flanked by Elijah and Moses. The time had come to retrace Moses' climactic encounter with God. And Moses brought the people to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. And he gave Moses two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Later that morning, I began my ascent of Jebel Musa, or Mount Moses. The Bible isn't specific about which mountain is Mount Sinai, but this mountain behind the monastery, the second tallest in the Sinai, is the most famous of the 22 candidates for the biblical Mount Sinai. Here we go, up the mountain. Okay. Father Justin, who would meet me halfway up, suggested I take a camel for the first leg of the trip. Where, where, do my, where do I put my leg? I like this. Lawrence of Arabia, he has it up there. Excuse me, can you remove this pole? And... No, no, so from up, good. Okay, fine. <laughs> After centuries of living in the flat Nile Delta, mountains would have been an unknown obstacle. How would the Israelites cross them? How could they survive? During their 800 years in the desert, the Israelites have mostly lived in flatland or low foothills. Now, for the first time, they confront a real mountain. Surely they were expecting something big. The Bible says they trembled, and sitting here, I can see why. Father Justin was waiting for me at one of the way stations for the many pilgrims who walk on what's known as the Path of Moses. We would continue on foot. Okay. Welcome. There's not a single tree in this whole range. It only rains here about three times a year. Now, okay, we're heading which way? The highest area right there is the pinnacle. That is the peak of Sinai. The biblical story is very ornate. Moses goes up, he comes back. He goes with 70 elders, he comes back. Then he goes with Aaron and Joshua. Why is this giving of the law so complicated? The first time he ascended, he was there 40 days and 40 nights, and the children of Israel lost patience. They didn't think he was coming back. They made the golden calf, which meant that they reverted back to the religion of the Egyptians. And then when Moses descended with the tablets of the law, he was so angry that he smashed the tablets. And then for 40 days and 40 nights, he asked God to have mercy on them. And then he ascended Sinai a second time. And that is when he descended with the tablets and all the law, not just the 10 commandments. In the early Christian era, 
monks began to store water on the side of the mountain, and as many as 300 lived here at one time. We stopped in one of the chapels that dot the route. May I light a candle? Please do. That is what pilgrims do. On Mount Moses, there are chapels dedicated to Elijah and Moses, as well as St. Gregory, St. John the Baptist, even the Virgin Mary. May I ask you a personal question? Why do you live here? Everyone is here because they treasure the heritage that is here. And living here, you enter into that heritage and become a part of that heritage. The biblical story suggests that it's hard to get close to God, even in the desert. Is that true? I think the ascent of the mountain is the perfect image. In the midst of the labor and in the midst of the toil, that is when we are purified. In this as well, the prophet Moses remains the paradigm for all of us. We're going to say goodbye now, and I'm going to go to the summit of the mountain. What should I listen for? The revelation of God is not something that can be predicted, but it is at holy places that we open our hand, and it is when we open our hand that we receive the gift. Thank you very much, Father. Okay. Godspeed. I began the final leg to the top of Mount Moses alone. I couldn't help wondering why the Bible doesn't give more details about where Mount Sinai is located. The higher I got, though, the more I realized maybe the Bible wants the location to be a mystery. Maybe it doesn't want us to focus on the physical details of the mountain, but on its spiritual meaning. For me, the significance of Mount Sinai is that at the climactic moment of the story, when God chooses to give his laws, he comes down to the land itself. In doing so, he cements that sacred relationship among the people, the land, and God. And sitting on this holy mountain, I can't help feeling the tug of that land. And it reminds me that in the same way God reaches out to humans at that moment, we have to reach out to him. We have to take ourselves away from the civilized world, into some desert, however personal, into some private place, where we triumph over our fears and finally open ourselves up to the promise yet to come. Israelites' acceptance of the Ten Commandments marks the beginning of their birth as a spiritual nation, committed to living within a strict moral framework. After a year, they continue their trek toward the Promised Land. For me, that meant driving north. Off the main road, we headed to a site that offers provocative insights into the Exodus from yet another era. The Bedouin call these stone structures nawamis, or mosquitoes. They believe the Israelites stayed in them to escape mosquitoes during their journey in the Sinai.
In fact, archaeologists have determined the Nawamis predate the Israelites. They are burial sites from 5,000 years ago. Pastoral nomads created these permanent burial spots so their dead could be assured of an afterlife. The Israelites' ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were also pastoral nomads. It was in the desert that the patriarchs defined their belief in one God. Now, after centuries of exile in Egypt, the Israelites returned to their wandering desert roots as they set out toward the Promised Land. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Go, see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether the land is rich or poor. returned after 40 days. The land where you sent us truly flows with milk and honey. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report. And the children of Israel complained, if only we had died in this wilderness, would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? The carcasses of you who complain shall fall in this wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely, 40 years. The desert not only cleanses, God seems to be saying, it offers space to grow and renew. Only by spending two generations in the wilderness will the Israelites fully purge themselves of their past and become a nation of God. For all those years, the Israelites wander from place to place in the Sinai. Then, Moses leads them across the Jordan River and north toward Mount Nebo, on the edge of the Promised Land. To follow their route, I flew over Wadi Rum, a 25-mile desert corridor. I was excited to meet my friend Avner Gorin, the Israeli archaeologist who had originally launched me on this biblical journey. Avner works on archaeology projects with Jordanians, Palestinians, as well as Israelis. He believes in building bridges among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We would continue on together. But first, he wanted me to meet some Bedouin friends. These modern pastoral tribes offer a window into what the Israelites may have experienced during their two generations in the wilderness. Traditionally, the Bedouin move in tribal groups, searching for grazing areas for their herds. They thrive in this harsh environment and draw meaning from living in vast open spaces. As the Bible demonstrates with Abraham and others, the rules of hospitality are central to desert life. Every visitor is entitled to three days of food and shelter, no questions asked, after which they are as welcome as a snake. Life in the desert is lived carefully. They use only a few modern utensils, 
When washing dishes, not a drop of water is wasted. Water must also be conserved for the animals. Herds are a measure of wealth and an integral part of their lives. Survival here depends on sensing and responding to every aspect of this ever-changing environment. Very beautiful home. The desert, its people and its spirit were seeping into my pores. I could feel the environment bringing me closer to my own understanding of God. How many people can stay in this tent? Ten to twelve, depending on how many rooms. So I live in a city, a very big city. If I came here to the desert to live with you, could I survive? Uh, this environment is a, a tranquil, peaceful place. So you'll have a healthy life. Jesus was a prophet. He lived in the desert. Moses was a prophet. He lived in the desert. Muhammad was a prophet. He lived in the desert. If you live in the desert, are you closer to God? Thank God we're close to him everywhere. In the desert, we live beneath our God. We make a living from our animals and live in the beauty of nature and quietness. The next morning, the idea of trekking through the wilderness was back on my mind, but with a new perspective. You know, I was thinking there are mountain people, there are beach people. I think I'm now a desert person. I just never realized it before. My father took me to the desert in a very young age, and I was amazed, amazed by the beauty, the power of the place. The desert gives you a different scale, different proportion, and I think that uh, it made me much more open to the world. The thing that's most appealing to me about the desert, I think, is that it reminds me of my own limitations, how needy we are as humans. When God forces the Israelites to spend so much time here, he pushes them to make a similar transition. What happens to me, I think, is that I wriggle free of my instincts, logic and reason, and stumble towards some new way of relating to the world, emotion, intuition, trust, and what happens when I leave here? Will I lose that feeling? Probably. But that's another appeal of the Bible, I think. It's like this remnant from the wilderness. Touch it, and we're in the desert ourselves. I was learning that success and survival in the desert demand constant adaptation, faith, and trust. This is precisely the lesson that the Israelites take so long to learn. At this point in our journey, we face the mystery of where this education took place. After recounting the hardships of the Israelites' first two years in the desert, the Bible is virtually silent on where they lived for the next 38 years. Many believe that the Israelites spent that time in the northern Sinai, but new research suggests they may have stayed in one of the most famous sites in Jordan. That's where we decided to go. This valley near the ancient lost city of Petra would have provided the Israelites a far better place to live, and the rugged, steep terrain would have offered natural protection. We headed for Petra on horseback the best way to get there through this narrow gorge known as the Seek. Petra was built by the Nabataeans, the tribe of wealthy Bedouin traders who thrived around the time of Christ.
Petra is famous for a signature structure called the treasury, a royal tomb carved out of the sandstone. It's so magnificent, it looks like a movie set. In fact, the treasury was featured in the film Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I realize we're in the desert, but with the columns and these friezes, it looks almost Greek. Yes, the Nabataean were nomads. They didn't have tradition of building, so they borrowed from the Greeks. So was this ever used as a treasury? No. The story says that the pharaoh chasing the Israelite hide these treasures over here. You mean the pharaoh of the Exodus? The pharaoh of the Exodus. Uh -huh. This legend persists despite the fact that the treasury wasn't built until long after the Israelites would have been here and far from when the pharaoh stopped chasing them. Legends of the Israelites are still part of the lore of Petra, which local Bedouin call the Valley of Moses. Nearby, some local vendors were taking an afternoon break. Moses came to this area. Will you help me understand, um, uh, why did Moses come here? Moses came here after his journey near the Dead Sea, and he was not allowed to go to the Holy Land. So how long did he stay in this area? He was in Egypt and then here in the desert for 40 years. Do you think that Moses spent 40 years in Petra? He stayed well. He, he stayed here for a period of time, for a long period of time. Although these buildings were carved a thousand years after Moses would have walked here, his route almost surely took him past these hills. <laughs> Avner and I settled in front of the royal tombs and pulled out our Bibles. You know, I saw this line in, um, in Deuteronomy 11. Therefore, impress my words upon your heart and teach them to your children. It's almost like they're in this national teaching. If you want to be God's chosen people, you've got to know God's laws. By the end of Deuteronomy, only a handful of people who escaped Egypt are still living. In the final chapters, Moses preaches to the Israelites on what they will face. His 40 years of leadership are almost over. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey his voice. There's a question I've been waiting a long time to ask you. Why did you come on this journey with me? I like adventure. Well, we have that. But you know, beside that, I was trying all my life to build bridges among people, among cultures, and the values of the Bible are universal. They belong to everyone. And also there is an old saying that I love, the way to keep a trail alive is to walk on it. The trail of Moses and his people now led us toward Mount Nebo, the place north of Amman, where the Bible says Moses dies. Mount Nebo is not far from the Dead Sea, and barely 30 miles due east of Jerusalem. Finally, we reached the rocky road, which leads to the ancient monastery perched on top. I opened my Bible to Deuteronomy 32. Ascend these heights to Mount Nebo, God says to Moses, facing Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I'm giving the Israelites as their holden. This is the third big scene happening on a mountain, right? You've got Ararat, Sinai, and now here comes Nebo. Well, mountains are landmarks, but I think that much more, they are high, they are close to heaven. After telling Moses to ascend Mount Nebo, God informs him that he will never set foot in the Promised Land. I always thought it was one of the saddest moments in the Bible. Do you think it's sad? 
No, Moses got much more. He got face-to-face -face meeting with God. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. That's the poetic twist at the end of the five books. The land is not the destination. The destination is the place where humans live in concert with the divine. Moses wasn't looking at the land. He was looking where we should look. He was looking at God. When I first started on this journey, I was interested in scientific and archaeological questions. By the end, I had a much more spiritual journey, drawing closer to the Bible and entering the story myself. In the end, I had reached the destination that the five books of Moses, at least, may have intended all along. I had reached the promised land, Israel, the place where one strives with God.